downward because of the assumptions that we've made in the plan. Uh, Dan came to us with 12 years experience on the BART board and extensive experience in government policy making as well as in the private sector and Mike Rossi was vice chair of Bank of America and had a, a career in being very um, diligent and conservative with respect to uh, one's money. So, uh, and, and I beg your apology, I'm going to have to leave, but I'm going to leave you in very capable hands here with Mr. Richard and Mr. Hartnett and Mr. Van Art. So, thank you. Well, we will miss your presence, but we thank you for your introduction. Well, they'll give you better answers, so I don't know about I'll, that. I'll have some questions. Thank you. I think now it's on. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Umberg. Have a safe flight back. Um, Assembly members, I'm Dan Richard. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I apologize for being <clears throat> a few minutes late. It's been a rather hectic day, as you could imagine, trying to, uh, uh, to address all these issues. Um, Mr. Van Ark uh, suggested that uh, we had, Mr. Rossi and myself, Mike Rossi and I, had come into this process <clears throat> with a lot of questions. And I think we brought the same questions to the High Speed Rail Authority that most people who had been outside the process, regular citizens, would have had. Um, let me just touch on a few of these because I think we want to get to your questions and comments. But first of all, I was, um, I was on the BART board for 12 years. And when I was on BART, it's an urban rail system. And it um, is funded with a combination of ridership revenues and then local sales taxes. So my experience in the transit system was that even though uh, we thought we were very efficient, we got about 62% of our costs covered by our riders at the fare box, and that's very, very good in American urban transit systems. I was quite proud of that, but it's not 100%. And so the, the bond measure, of course, said that there can be no operating subsidy for high-speed rail. So literally, I, I, I think within the first 15 minutes when I met uh, Mr. Van Ark, uh, I turned to him and I said, well, my question is, can this thing even work? Because my experience is such that it always requires some level of public subsidy. And what I learned from uh, Ruloff and also from Mike Rossi, who has um, uh, lived in many places around the world, lived in Tokyo, worked with the, uh, financing the Japan rail system and other things, is that, um, in fact, high-speed rail is different. It has a different business model, primarily because it competes against airline fares and we see a massive mode shift in Europe and other places when a high-speed rail line goes in and there's a big shift off of, uh, off of airline travel. And what I now believe to be the case is what's been told to me that every one of these high-speed rail systems around the world generates enough money to pay its operating cost. I know this has been a, a, a source of uh, public dialogue, but every single one does. Now, they don't generate enough to pay their capital cost back. But they do generate enough to pay their operating cost. And indeed, they generate enough revenue to pay for future, uh, for future investment, uh, in, uh, investments in the leg, uh, in additional legs of uh, the system. And we fully anticipate this will be the situation uh, here in California. Uh, now, um, Mr. Van Ark was talking about the ridership models Mike Rossi has spent a career in finance uh, for reasons that I can't comprehend, becoming an expert in financial and other types of modeling. And he can talk the language of modelers in a way that I could never hope to. Uh, what he did was he came in and he sat down and realizing that the ridership model is at the heart of this, that fundamentally if you don't have ridership, you don't have revenue, which means you can't cover your costs. Uh, really dove deeply into the ridership numbers. And of course, everyone here knows that the, the former ridership projections were the subject to very intense criticism from respected sources like the Institute of Transportation Studies at Berkeley and so forth. So we really wanted to get it right. Well, first of all, um, Mr. Van Ark is to be complimented because he stepped back from those earlier uh, critiques and created a peer review group that included international experts. And we even, uh, he even reached out to some of the critics uh, like ITS and they suggested people who would be appropriate for this peer review group. It was an independent peer review group. 
Uh, the names of the members are in your report. Mike Rossi has uh, spent time talking with Dr. Frank Koppelman, who's the chair of that peer review group with other members of it, talking with the people who run the model. And this is basically what he found as a result. Number one, the model is sound in terms of the way that it operates. Questions would be about the input assumptions that go into it. And in every case, as the model has been revised for this business plan, every, in every case we have picked the conservative assumptions. So for example, one of the biggest drivers of ridership and the ridership model is what the future population will be of California. The Department of Finance, as you know here in the Capitol, uh, is very actively involved in an ongoing process of analyzing California population growth. And they have a series of estimates about population. Our ridership model uses basic population estimates that are below the lowest level forecast of the Department of Finance. So that's a big conservatism. Another big driver would be fuel costs. And there, we're assuming that gasoline prices will be fixed at $3.80 a gallon, where all of the metropolitan planning organizations are using $5 a gallon. Another input assumption is mode, uh, transportation mode. Uh, if people are mainly driving down the road for personal business, they're less likely to use high-speed rail than someone who would be driving from Fresno to San Francisco on a business trip. So we used very unfavorable mode uh, splits, uh, unfavorable to high-speed rail. So in every case, we tried to use the conservative numbers. Having done that, we have low, medium, and high forecast numbers for high-speed rail. But then Mike Rossi came in and said, well, I want to know what the break-even point is. I want to know where we would be against those forecasts and still be able to cover our operating costs. <clears throat> and he asked our uh, consulting staff to do that break-even analysis, which they've done. What we believe is that once the initial operating segment is built, and that's when we first bring true high-speed rail to California, that um, that segment will produce sufficient ridership to create a fairly significant amount of uh, revenue. In fact, if we build that initial operating segment from Merced to the San Fernando Valley, uh, the numbers, I think, and I'm looking at uh, Kurt Ramey, are like $6 billion of NP read revenue for that, for that uh, leg. The break-even analysis shows that even if we were below our lowest forecast, which again is based on these conservative numbers, by the second or third year of operation, we could be like 15% below our lowest numbers and still break even. So by the time you add up the conservatism of the inputs, the use of certain ranges of models, and then the break-even analysis, we just feel very, very comfortable that the ridership numbers are sound. And that means that we will be in a position to generate revenue for each of the legs that we build out. So that's a very important conversation to have with the legislature and with the people of California because the vote said that there could be no operating subsidy with the use of the Prop 1A bond money, and we feel very confident about that. Yes, Assemblywoman. Rather than have this just be a dialogue go I'm one so way. I'm sorry. I, I, no, not at all. I've been listening up until now, but I do have some questions on the yes, ridership. Um, we, I have here, if I'm looking right at page, uh, at section 6, page 17, that is the ridership that you plan on having. It's exhibit 616. Mm-hmm. And we have a medium ridership scenario at ticket price of 83% of airfare, and that's 35.8 million people for full phase one. Right. And that's annually. Right, but full full phase one. Yes, that's that's right. The full phase one. Let's um, uh, uh, let's make sure that we're being clear. When we say phase one, unfortunately it has two meanings. The common sense meaning is the first step that we would take. But phase one in this case San means Francisco to Los Angeles? Yeah, to is Anaheim. That what you're talking That's right. about? Anaheim. Okay. Um, 
how are you calculating that? Because I, I've, I've not seen this. All I have is the, the, uh, the numbers here. I don't have the background information, but I know that number's been questioned before. It's not that far off from where we were. We were saying before that we'd have 39 million people riding this and, in essence, paying more than they, and, and traveling slower uh, than they would to take a, an economy airfare. Um, in 2010, Amtrak carried 29.1 million passengers for the entire year. Uh, how is California going to, uh, between San Francisco and Los Angeles, move 35 million people a year? How well, does that work? First of all, the two you said 2001. I mean, this is a 2035 number. So um, in terms of apples to apples, we have to look at that. I'm a little bit at a loss because Mr. Rossi is the one who went through this. Uh, Ruloff, I don't know um, if this is uh, something you can address or if we'll need to supplement uh, the information. I, I'd just like to say that, you know, you can't compare the Amtrak countrywide pop, um, ridership figures with the high-speed rail ridership figures. I mean, Amtrak is, is in many, many corridors in the, in the country. They are operating an, an under, you know, a, a system that is not necessarily attracting uh, riders because it's not really offering uh, a competitive alternative to any other mode of transportation. It's a very slow system, as you know, in most parts of the, of the country. The only place where uh, you can compare Amtrak is in the Northeast Corridor. And in the Northeast Corridor, the Amtrak, uh, the Acela system in the Northeast Corridor basically is running at capacity. Uh, basically is running at about 170 percent of uh, the operations and maintenance cost. That means it's got a 70 percent over coverage on, uh, or profit on its operations and maintenance costs. So, you know, we can't compare. Well, Acela, I believe, is subsidized uh, by Amtrak. Are they not? No, Acela is not. Uh, it's the opposite way around, that Acela makes a profit. And the profit out of Acela is used to subsidize all the other loss-making lines around the country, and, and the Amtrak as a whole is subsidized. You're correct about that. But the actual the seller service in, on the Northeast Corridor is profitable and makes about a, it's got a coverage of about 170% on its fare bar. Well, things must have changed dramatically. The, the latest report that I have is a 2004 study that documented the seller's losses at about 51 million, but covered by an overall annual subsidy of nearly 1 billion by Amtrak. So I, I will submit my questions to you in writing, but I'm, sure. I'm questioning that. I also, um, I have a lot of other questions that I'm sure we could, we could get to. Um, one is, um, why are we starting in the Central Valley? Why does that have to be background and, and backbone and ground zero for this? Well, Since I, there's a lot of opposition right now, and we don't really have the money to complete an operating segment. We're doing a construction section that's going to be ripping up farmland and kind of destroying businesses. Uh, well, let me take that question, but the uh, the... Uh, the lawyer in me says, uh, I, I think the, the, the second part I would object to because, I, I mean, we're, we're in an environmental process right now. I don't know that we're going to be destroying businesses when we get done with the environmental process. We will see. But we have to be very sensitive how we go through any community, whether it's the Valley or any other community. And what, um, what Jim Hartnett has been working on in the peninsula is to talk about um, how we go through communities with the minimum of impact. And I you know, I believe that that's the way that we should approach all communities, no matter uh, where we're building the system. But I'd like to address this uh, this issue, um, Assembly Member, because I came on to the authority as a skeptic of starting in the valley. I had the same questions that other people did about why we would start in the valley, and I've said several times uh, in recent days that uh, now I stand up and say that I believe that that's the right decision for a lot of reasons. Uh, we all know that the stimulus money application was geared towards the valley, and so we'll just say that and put that behind us because that's there. But there are ample reasons to be starting in the valley apart from uh, the stimulus money. And really, uh, one of the keys is this new blended approach that we've embraced. So the fact of the matter is that we have 
an opportunity to use existing right-of-way, existing corridors, and existing rail infrastructure on the San Francisco Peninsula and as we move into the Southland with Caltrain and Metrolink. So we know what corridors we're going to use there, and we know that we need to now work in partnership with those, uh, with those systems to develop long-term plans for blended service and beyond. The one place where there, there isn't that type of infrastructure that we can use, really, is in the valley. Uh, so we have the opportunity to acquire right-of-way in the valley that doesn't really exist right now as a usable segment for high-speed rail. And that right-of-way will have real value. I mean, it'll probably be $400 million worth of right-of-way value in the, in the Central Valley. And if we don't do that now, it's one of the faster growing areas of the state, and so that will be just harder to acquire in the future. So that's point number one. Point number two is that ultimately the valley is where the trains will run the fastest. At some point we'll be buying high-speed rail train sets, and we'll want them capable of the fastest speeds. So the notion that we would start, say, on the Peninsula Corridor or someplace else and have these trains and never know how we would run them at their highest speeds is, is really problematic. Um, we get the most track per dollar in the valley, and so that's another good reason to start there. And finally, again, it comes back to this blended approach that uh, Jim Hartnett has worked on so diligently and for which we give credit to your colleagues, Senator Simidian and Assemblymember Gordon and also Congresswoman Eshoo, and that is that we now have a system that we're looking at that when we come out of the valley, connecting either to the uh, Southland area or to the Bay Area, we'll have other trains there waiting to connect. So people will be able to go from Merced to somewhere in the San Fernando Valley, do a cross-platform transfer onto uh, one of the regional rail systems all the way into Union Station in L.A. Or, or down to Anaheim. Or if we build the initial operating segment to the north from Bakersfield up to San Jose, cross-platform transfer onto Caltrain. So we're going to be working together now with these other agencies to be not only building our spinal segment in the valley, but also improving their segments with advanced uh, investments in those systems. And it's less of an either-or question than I think it's been in the past because we're also trying to free up the resources to help them build up their systems at the end. So we'll be doing major construction in the valley. We'll be working with them at the same time on the ends, and the idea will be that as we come out of the valley to connect to one of our mega centers, that we'll be handshaking with those other systems. Thank you. I think you made a, um, an incorrect, or maybe it was a correct statement, kind of a Freudian slip. You'll be doing major destruction in the Central Valley. <laughs> I don't think I said that. Yeah, that's what you said, but that's okay. That's kind of the opinion that I have, and so I'm a little bit concerned that we at least be able to build a rail. Um, I heard that there was going to be direct investment, uh, direct local investment. Where is that direct local investment coming from? I know we have some bond funds set aside, but of the, what, 975, I think your report says there's only 82 billion that have been let to the local agencies. That's right. My understanding, um, uh, you're absolutely correct. The, uh, the bond measure, uh, Proposition 1A, uh, provided $9 billion of funding to come through the California High-Speed Rail Authority and an additional $950 million that was to be allocated by the California Transportation Commission for interconnectivity with high-speed rail. And uh, only some small piece of that for positive train control has up till now been um, acceptably allocated. And it's my understanding, and I'm new to this, that two different administrations, the last one and this one, have both vetoed uh, other attempts to allocate some of those dollars because there hasn't been good coordination between high-speed rail and CTC. We have reached out to the California Transportation Commission um, uh, Commission Chair Dario Fromer had intended to be with us today. He was fogged into Los Angeles. He didn't have a train to take to Northern California, so he had no way to get there. But he, uh, he issued a statement that uh, uh, they're looking forward to working with us. So that 950, what's remaining of it, uh, becomes one source of trying to uh, move advanced investments into those systems. Another source would be we're realistic, uh, Assembly Member, about um, the unlikelihood of getting federal dollars in the near term 
but we think that there are potential federal dollars for those systems. We will be working with those systems to try to help get money for them through that appropriations process. And finally, and I, I think that uh, uh, for, for people who uh, are really looking for private sector involvement, this would be important. Some of those legs, and Mr. Hartnett can talk about this, uh, uh, Mike Scanlon from Caltrain said he agrees with this. Some of those legs actually are probably more ready for private investment now than we are because they do have an established level of ridership. And I think there's a new dialogue that's coming about from some of the private capital sources about ways to come in and do public-private partnerships on those lines. So we've got the bond money that the public has already voted for. We've got the opportunity to work with them to lobby for federal money for those regional rail upgrades. And we've got the opportunity to work with the private sector um, as, as three ways to put an emphasis on those. And I don't know, Jim, if there's anything you want to add to that. Well, I, I think uh, in, the, uh, in the Caltrain example, uh, there, uh, there are three partners to Caltrain. Uh, there's uh, Santa Clara County VTA, San Mateo County uh, Transportation uh, Agency, and, and uh, the, uh, the, the Muni in San Francisco. And uh, they, in their long-term planning for the quarter, um, uh, have identified electrification as uh, uh, totally separate and apart from the, from the needs of high-speed rail as an as important part of, for the sustainability of that system. And so they have some resources that they've identified that uh, support that, and that's synergistic with the high-speed rail needs. Uh, because. That the shared corridor, which is what it would be, would need to be uh, entirely electrified. And so that's important for Caltrain independently as well as it is for high-speed rail. So that's, uh, that's another example. I think we're, we're kind of a long way off, though, from having this connect to a shared corridor if we've got $3 billion plus another 2 point some billion, let's say about $6 billion to begin for 120 miles in the Central Valley. And um, I know that there are cities who, or counties that um, have a property tax, um, not a property tax, a sales tax increase for local transportation. Are you relying on that at all, the local transportation dollars to fund? No. No. Okay. Um, I still don't, I'm not, I'm still not clear as to why we're starting in the Central Valley. Um, I know you, you did say that it's the, it's, you can, you can test, test drive, so to speak, the train, because it gives you a long stretch. Um, I've, I've had a chance to look through quite, quite a bit of this, and I'm looking at the ridership is going to be a key, it's a key component, the ridership and the price point. Also, the, the larger issue, though, I believe for the people of California and for this legislature and for this governor is going to be where you find the funding and how we repay it. Our debt, we're, we're maxed out and we're one of the lowest credit rating. I think New York might be one lower than us. Illinois is higher in, in the nation. And um, the last time we went out for a bond offering on high-speed rail, we don't we don't offer on high-speed rail. Excuse me, we offer a general obligation bonds, of which a portion is carved out for uh, a small portion for high-speed rail. But we're basically selling one to two billion dollar increments for everything in the state, and just barely getting bidders for that, even though we lower the price of our bond or lower the lower the issuance of our bond, and uh, probably pay a little bit higher rate. So I think. The overall overriding question to this whole project to me, you know, you can debate the ridership with me and I can probably come back with uh, studies that will show that it's, it's not realistic. You can uh, debate that whether there's going to be a subsidy or not and I can probably come back and show you studies that it's not realistic. But why are we starting something that we don't have any money to build? And I understand we've got a mission and a purpose, and I understand why the California High Speed Rail Authority is doing it. That's their mission. That's what they're tasked with. But I don't understand why the state would be attempting to proceed with this now when other states have used similar monies, small amounts, and improved some of their existing infrastructure to maybe eventually some point, sometime do a high-speed rail, 
but to find survey uh, medallions in the Central Valley right now and um, still the EIRs aren't finished. I'm, I'm a little bit confused and um, a little bit alarmed that we are going down this path so fast, even though it's not fast to you. It is very fast compared to the money that we have. High-speed rail is not the only thing on the agenda. We're cutting schools. We're, we're cutting um, services. Uh, we're planning on spending an additional 30 percent over the next few years for uh, California health care. Um, and we don't have any bonding capacity left. And the infrastructure bank idea, which would allow us to multiply that, doesn't seem to be becoming a reality because the, the government is broke at the federal level as well. Kind of thank goodness, but um, California is drowning in debt. And it, if I look at this, we're not only going to be drowning in debt, but we're going to continue to have operating deficits. This this line will be subsidized. It's going to be an oops moment. It's going to be, you know, we promised that we wouldn't have a subsidy, but what do we do now? We've got a section built here and a section built there, and I don't know uh, how you're going to justify or assure that the ridership's there. I think when the people of California approved that bond, we were told that the riders, the ridership would pay for the cost. Now, the cost is not just to riders, the operating cost. The cost was also, you know, that the nine billion dollars would in essence cover it and you will be you will be held hostage for no more taxpayers of california but now this study shows 98 billion dollars and it shows 14 to 15 to 20 to 30 for segments or sections and um i think there's going to be a little sticker shop by the people of california the more they learn the less they like and that shouldn't be with something that is so valued. I, I, I do believe uh, that this will start anyway, because I think you're on a mission to begin. But I do hope that um, everybody just takes a little bit of a deep breath, including this governor. Uh, and if we have, if six billion dollars is burning a hole in our pocket, then by all means, let's spend it somewhere. But let's do some good with it because right now this is not the time to be starting this. And it's not just because we're in a uh, downturn that almost every economist I know is projecting to go on very, very slow anemic growth for at least the next 10 years. It's because it's really a huge undertaking in a state that has on its own seen an extreme downturn just by its own actions and, and just accumulated a ton of debt and we can't pay our bills and we're losing working populations. So I appreciate what you're doing. I think you've been tasked with the impossible dream um, and I'm hoping it doesn't turn into California's nightmare. Well, Assembly Member, um, uh, as a member of the legislature, uh, you, you, you get the last word on this. Um, at least for today. Um, over the next 60 days, so we have a comment period. This is a draft document. Uh, we have reached out to people across the state, uh, both supporters and uh, critics uh, or, or people who question high-speed rail, uh, and we will continue to do that. Um, I look forward to engaging with you and your colleagues on this. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the numbers that we have here are sound, but uh, I understand your concerns. And uh, uh, I personally just would say to you that I'm not on any kind of a mission except um, one to try to serve the people of the state. And if high-speed rail turns out to not make sense, you would not see me sitting up here saying that I believe it does. Um, but I just would thank you and, and the members of the legislative staff for coming out today. Um, our organization will be uh, open and available to you and to your staff uh, and to your colleagues' staff to address any of these questions. And at the end of the day, we may end up with different points of view, but uh, we, we will be brutally honest about what the choices are here and what the costs are as well as the benefits. And uh, uh, I hope that's the focus of our public debate. Um, I believe.